Hello, Smart Money Trip Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm, and I'll be your host. So today, I'm joined with Christopher Zook. How are you doing today, Christopher? Excellent. Thank you for having me. Good. Well, we brought Christopher on the show because there are a lot of cool things that he does. And I know listeners of the show love learning about alternative investments. And Christopher's got an interesting one that uh, some people may not have heard of, which makes it even more interesting. So Christopher, tell us a little bit about your background. So long, uh, uh, lifelong Houstonian, grew up here, been in Texas my entire life. I've been in the investment business for about 32, 33 years now. Started this firm in 2001 with the backing of several of the large families in uh, in the state. And we get to do very unique things and invest anywhere, anytime, and anything. Nice. So how did you get started in the investment business? What drew you to the investment business? You know, always been in, interested in the investment world since really high school, but particularly in college. I helped put myself through college by trading commodities and futures in order to be able to help pay for my tuition and my and my expenses. So one of the ways that I did that. So always interested in the investment side of the world, always interested in the alternative world, because while certainly you know, invested in traditional stocks and bonds over the years have done a tremendous amount of alternatives and more and more of the opportunities that we have seen over the last couple of decades have been based in the alternative world and particularly in things that are not plain vanilla, not run of the mill, certainly not exchange traded funds, things of that nature. And we're a very thematic investor. So we look for the right theme. We try to find the best risk reward and then the best way to partner with someone to take advantage of that theme. And sometimes that is available in the public markets, but many times it is not. And so that's why we tend to go more and more to the alternatives. Nice. So I know you work a lot with uh, GP stakes, and I'm sure people have probably most people have never even heard of this, but tell us what is a GP stake? How does it work? Tell us a little bit about it. So it starts with the theme. And so the theme for us in this particular situation is the growth of private assets as an asset class. And just like this conversation that we're having today, there are many, many conversations that are happening all over the globe with people that are wanting to get more exposure to alternative investments. So I sit chair the investment committee for the state of Texas Pension Review Board, and there's very few things that almost all of the plans have in common. We're talking about the teacher's retirement system of Texas down to Laredo Fire, as an example. One thing that almost all of them have in common is they're looking to increase their alternative exposure away from just traditional plain vanilla stocks and bonds. So the theme is how do you make money? from the growth of private assets. Well, the best way that we feel to do that is to own a piece of the firms that are managing that money. And so that's where the term GP comes from. So in a partnership structure, you have a GP, a general partner, and then you have an LP, the limited partner. So most investors are just limited partners. They put money in a fund, they hope it does well, and then they find out later how well it did. Well, when you're the manager of that fund, you're charging a management fee, you're getting a carried interest, you also are investing some of your own capital. So you're getting the opportunity to manage that money on behalf of other people and to get paid for doing it. So the convergence of the theme is basically a lot of money going into alternative investments. Let's own the alternative managers who are going to get and benefit from all that money. So what you're saying is if, uh, let's say, a hedge fund has a GP uh, in the hedge fund and they were to sell part of that then the person buying the GP would get the, let's say, two and 20 if that's what they were doing. Uh, that is exactly right. And that's really where the industry started, but that's not where it really is today. And it's not where we focus. So the hedge fund world was the first place to where you have a hedge fund manager, they would sell a portion of their business. And then the owner of that stake, a minority partner, would be able to benefit from the management fees and the incentive fee that was earned by the hedge funds. Well, about 10 years ago, they started changing the approach, the people that were involved in the area started making more of a focus on private asset management firms, firms where you have private equity, private credit, real estate, infrastructure, et cetera. And in those particular cases, it's very different than the hedge fund model. In the hedge fund world, if somebody has two great years of performance, they're going to make a ton of money. And if they have two bad years of performance in a row, they're probably out of business. Well, in the private asset world, you actually have locked up contractually obligated LPs. They cannot get out. Even if they wanted to get out, they cannot do so by contract. Mm 
So they have to pay management fees for five to 10 years and then also carry an interest based on success, the percentage of the profits carried interest, same thing, uh, to the manager of that particular fund. And obviously what we love is owning a piece of the firm that is managing that portfolio. And over the last decade, we've become the second largest in the world at providing capital to those that specialize in this area. And we've invested a little bit over $3 billion in the space. And the reason why is there's very few things in 33 years, really nothing that I've ever seen in 33 years that provides the downside protection from those management fees that are contractual, the upside optionality that comes from the carried interest and the growth of the business itself, and the predictability and the cash flow that we're able to earn on these very profitable businesses. These are some of the most profitable businesses in the world. And we obviously get to share in that day one from the time that we buy our stake. Nice. So what are some examples of some of those assets that you're that you're talking about? So the firms that we own stakes, we own stakes in over 60 different firms. And they're most of the high profile, you know, private equity, private credit firms that some of your listeners may be familiar with. Silver Lake, Starwood in real estate, Vista and Enterprise Software. Platinum Equity and Buyout, Golub Capital in the in the private credit world, Monroe Capital in the credit world as well. And the list goes on and on 60 plus. But so all of these firms do something very unique and differentiated. They're usually 10 to 30 years old, or if not 40, in the case of NEA Associates, one of the granddaddies of Silicon Valley. And they all do something that has differentiated them from their competition and allowed them to grow to become very, very successful. Those are the kinds of firms that we're going to buy stakes in. Okay, cool. So, you know, when you're when you've chosen to use this, I know you you said you're you're involved in some athletic uh, enterprises as well. How do, how do those play in? So they're very different. So going back to the point of us being very thematic. So the theme for us. It, it's actually funny. I'll take a step back. It's very funny because of the fact that many people hear that we are one of the largest minority owners of sports teams, you know, in the United States. And they go, well, that's, you just think it's cool and it's fun. And the answer is yes, it is kind of cool. And yes, it is fun to own a piece of the Houston Astros and watch them through the, the, the division series that they're playing right now. But ultimately that's not why we own sports teams. Not just because they're trophy assets, not just because of the fact that they're cool, but it goes back to the core theme, which is cord cutting. If you think about one definitive theme that most every single person would agree on is that there's going to be more and more cord cutting and more streaming services that pop up as opposed to people going back to broadcast or cable. Well, if that's the case, the advertisers are kind of stuck. They're in a position today where they literally are unable to reach their audience unless they do one of two things. They target via social media or they go in large broadcast to live events. That's really the only way to get people to watch a commercial. So if that is the case, the largest share of large events, overwhelmingly 93% of the 93 of the top 100 live events are sporting events. So those live events, people will tolerate the commercial. And obviously, in the case of the Super Bowl, they actually get a lot of excitement about watching the commercials, which is a little unusual. But they will watch the commercials, which means the advertisers will pay a lot of money to be able to reach those eyeballs and to be able to reach those audiences. And so the best way to monetize that theme is to take advantage of it by owning a piece of the firms providing the content, which in this case would be professional sports teams that obviously have a legal monopoly. Nobody's allowed to compete with them and an incredible, durable, incredibly durable revenue model that is a lot less predictable, a lot more predictable, excuse me, than most people will think that it is. A lot of people think you've got to really win on the field in order to make good money. Well, certainly you want to win. And that is what ultimately will drive some of your value. But the vast majority of your revenue doesn't actually come from whether you have wins or losses. It has to do with the size of the franchise, your platform, and how many basically advertisers are trying to reach your audience. And the bigger your audience, obviously, the more you're going to be able to charge for that. And that's at the league level as well as at the individual team level. Nice. So I want to go back to the GP stake really quick because there was uh, something that kind of came to mind, which is... Um, why are these so first of all the gp stakes are they with an individual asset or are they with the firm or a fund or what what's the specific thing that are traded 
So the entire firm, and that's really, really important because you don't want to be conflicted between, you know, this fund is good, this fund is bad, or this is a good time, or that's a bad time. When you own the firm, you own all of the above, everything that they have currently in the ground and everything that they ever do. So the first part of your question is actually the most important question. These are really, really smart people who built amazing businesses. If they're a seller, why would I want to be a buyer? And the answer is there has to be a strategic reason. If somebody's just looking to get money to go to the beach, that's really not interesting to us at all. It's not something that we would get involved in. It's almost always the classic reason why companies of all types and sizes will raise money from third parties. And that is to grow faster than they would be able to on their own. And a quick illustration drives that home. Let's say you've got a firm that raises a billion dollar fund and they put 5% of the money up themselves to show their alignment with their LPs. Well, that's $50 million on a billion dollars. That's real money. But then they raise a $3 billion fund. Now they've got to put up $150 million and they haven't got the $50 million back yet. And then they raise a $5 billion fund. Now they got to put up $250 million and they haven't gotten back the 150 or the 50. At some point, you have to have outside capital to be able to fuel your growth or you have to slow your growth. Not many people want to slow down. So they, in order to achieve that fund over fund growth, they're going to raise capital from a partner that not only can bring a check, but also can bring strategic value, which is another reason why somebody might sell a stake. Let's say that you're a lower middle market US buyout firm. You have great limited partners here in the United States, but you have no limited partners in Europe. You have no limited partners in the Middle East. You have no limited partners in Asia. Well, if you can sell a stake to a firm who can then open up those channels to help you grow faster, that's really good. So just to use round numbers, if somebody sells 20% of their, of their company, they obviously want a fair price for that 20%, but they're much more focused on what the 80% is going to be worth after that partnership has been able to evolve. That is the number one reason. And that other reasons such as new business lines, new geographic expansion, those kinds of things, but the number one reason is a strategic growth capital to help them grow faster than they would on their own. One of the firms, as an example, we bought about six years ago when we acquired our stake, they had 13 billion in assets under management. Today, they have over a hundred billion dollars in assets under management. We obviously have been able to participate in the growth and we also provided a lot of capital to help them to accelerate that growth. So- Knowing that the public markets typically give you the, the the highest multiples, why wouldn't these firms just go public and raise capital that way? Some of them do. And actually, there's a big trend today. As an example, CVC, which we own a stake in for full disclosure, CVC has very much fast-tracked the possibility of going public here in the next couple of months, according to the reports that we've seen in the media. Now, CVC absolutely is tapping the public markets for some of those exact same reasons. Some firms don't want to be public. You know, we all know a lot of companies that just don't want to deal with the, 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 the scrutiny, the additional regulatory oversight, et cetera. So they choose to stay private. Other companies will grow quickly using private capital, and then they will ultimately go public as a means to create liquidity for either their existing shareholders or for their team and a way to use uh, their currency as an accretive um, acquisition tool to be able to make acquisitions, et cetera. So we are seeing more and more of that trend. So it depends on where they are in their life cycle. Some of them certainly, you know, a $3 billion, $5 billion, $10 billion firm, they're not going to go public. But if you're talking about CVC or Bridgepoint went public, you know, you have several others, like just recently you had TPG go public. You obviously have the other much larger firms that have been public for a long time. But so there will be more and more public offerings. And one of the things that we love about it is that we then have the option to sell our position, but not the obligation. So, you know, Rock merged with Dial, became Blue Owl, now publicly traded. We own our stake. If we wanted to, we could monetize that. Just the same, we could choose to hold it for the next decade or longer, and we get a lot of cash flow. And we obviously get the liquidity benefit if we want it. We don't have to have it. That's another reason why some firms will go public is to be able to consolidate a, a, a larger group, multiple groups into one, and then ultimately go public that way, which is a trend that I think will come back 
as the public markets become a little more favorable in the next couple of years. Okay, cool. So let me ask you this. What are some of the risks of owning a GP stake? So, you know, it's like any other business. You know, the, the advantage of the GP stake itself is that you have the contractual fees. So, you know, if you raised your billion dollar fund, and you're going to get 2% management fee for the next five years, you're going to get 20 million a year for the next five years. You know you have $100 million of revenue. If you know for sure that you're going to make $100 million over the next five years, your budgeting becomes pretty easy. You can usually operate at whatever margin you feel is the right margin for you. And then you get the upside where you turn that billion into 2 billion. Well, obviously you're going to make $200 million in carried interest on that as well. So the flip side of that argument is where the risks do come in, which is if you aren't able to continue to raise new funds, well, then ultimately you're going to, you know, go out of business. You're not going to be able to continue. But that's where the GP stakes are really so compelling and why we've gone in such a meaningful way as one of the, the first movers in the space is because in, mis in not all cases, but in most cases, just from those contractual management fees, we literally have 20% risk. If they literally go out of business, we get 80% of our money back. And if they do well, we could make two, three, four times our money, depending on how quickly they grow. But so there's very few things in the world where you can have a 20% risk and a 200 to 300% return opportunity with high predictability and high cash flows. But ultimately that is the risk, is that they cannot continue to grow their business if they stub their toe and have a couple of bad vintages in a row, which, by the way, is a very important differentiator. You, you started the conversation with hedge funds. You know, in, if, if you have two years of bad performance in a hedge fund, you're probably out of business. If you have two years of bad performance in a private equity fund, you have time to fix it because you, the clients can't get out. The LPs can't get out. So you might have to wait longer and the returns may not be fantastic, but you're not literally put out of business in two years. Now, if you have a bad vintage, you know, you raise a fund in 23 and it doesn't do very well and you raise another fund in 25 and it doesn't do very well, it's probably going to be pretty tough to raise another fund in the future. And that's why you don't want to just own one. You want to own a portfolio of these because it's going to provide the protection against one of them stubbing their toe because it does happen. But it's really rare, particularly with the type of firms that we generally invest in. They're large, they're established, they've done it for decades, they have top tier performance and a blue chip institutional LP base that are going to continue to support them, even if they had a less than stellar vintage, because they're just very predictable and they're very consistent in what they do. So that sounds interesting. So why only 20% downside risk? Can you kind of explain that for the listeners? So let's just, I'll use overly simplistic math for the purposes of, of, of this conversation. Let's just say that the firm was worth a billion dollars when you bought 20% of it, you would write a check for $200 million. And if that is the case, if the firm is worth a billion, let's just say, again, for argument's sake, that they have 10 billion in assets under management. So 10 billion in assets, a billion dollars in valuation, and you buy 20% for 200 million. Well, on that $10 billion, Again, using round numbers, let's assume their average management fee is one and a half percent. Some is a little bit later, some is a little bit earlier. They haven't invested at all, whatever the case might be. So you've got $150 million of contractual revenue, no matter what. And you, as the owner of 20% of the business, are going to get 30 million of that revenue. Now, obviously, you have expenses. So let's just again keep it abundantly simple. If you had 50% profit margins, which again, if you know what your revenue is going to be and all you have is people as your main expense, you can operate as a 50% margin very easily. So your share is now 30 million of revenue, 50% profit margin, that's $15 million. If they just do that for the next eight years, well, then that would be $120 million of profit cash flow to you on your $200 million investment. That would be 60% of your money back. But also, if you remember, so much of this money is going on the balance sheet and going into the funds. So let's just say on that $10 billion that they put up $500 million of their own money. You, your $200 million, $100 million of it just went in. And literally, if you just get that back, you're going to get 
more than your entire cost back. In my simple math, you're actually going to get more than 100% of your money back. Normally, the way it works is that if things just really don't go well, again, it depends on the size of the firm. Sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's higher. You got a situation where you're going to get 80% of your money back. One of the situations right now that we're looking at, literally, if they don't ever raise another dollar ever again, you're going to get 100% of your money back just from the management fees alone. If they never make another dollar of profits for investors ever again, which is really, it's possible, but not plausible, then you're still going to get 100% of your money back. And if you think, see things go really according to plan, you're going to end up with anywhere between a two and a three X multiple. Now, obviously the earlier the stage, it's a smaller firm, you might have 50% of risk. You might have 70% of risk. But if you look at the more established companies that have large contractual management fees across a diversified base of funds, it's obviously very, very low downside with a lot of positive asymmetry, positive upside. Nice. So one thing that kind of comes to mind when you talk about private equity is, you know, private equity has done really well in the last, I don't know, 15 years, let's say. And a lot of money has been chasing that, especially in the endowments and the foundations and, you know, large institutional money is chasing it because you can't get that kind of return in the, in the public markets. So you look at like, you know, schools like Yale and Harvard and a bunch of others, they have maybe less than 10% in the public markets, which is kind of scary to think about, but that's, that's, that's what they perceive as the risk to reward. So I ask the question is, is, at what point does private equity become overvalued? I mean, you know, we want to get into a little bit what's going on in the world um, from a macro perspective. But at what point do you just say, all right, this this is too overpriced and doesn't make sense anymore? Does that ever come into play? So everything is cyclical and everything gets cheap at times and everything gets expensive at times. You know, 2021, everything in the world was expensive. Fixed income was expensive. Equities were expensive. SPAC bubble, all the other things that we could talk about. Private equity was also probably chasing things at prices too high. To your point, though, everything is a cycle. The advantage that private equity has is that for 35 of the last 35 years, it's outperformed the public markets. 35 out of 35. That is something that causes the Harvards and Yales and the endowments to say, I want more of that. Now, timing does matter. That's why we talk about vintage diversification. If somebody just put a bunch of money into a private equity fund in 2020 and it was all deployed in 2021, <laughs> that is not going to be a good vintage. It's no different than a bottle of wine that has bad weather, right? That vintage is not going to be very good. Just the same if someone put a bunch of money into a private equity firm at the end of 21, that was all invested in 22 and 23, it's probably going to be a really good vintage. So it does go in cycles, which is why for us, where we own 60 plus different firms, we have firms that are going to absolutely top tick the market and raise funds at the worst possible time. We also are going to have some firms that are going to bottom tick the market and raise money at the best possible point in time and everything in between. But that's what smooths out the ride and gives us that diversification. Now, the other thing that's really important about the question that you asked is that the investors themselves are all looking at things on a relative basis. So if you can get a higher return in private equity than public equity, and you typically have less volatility simply because it doesn't go yippity yap every day and you know on the whims of what the investing public wants it to do you'll actually look at the value of the company and it does move with the economic cycle but it doesn't get marked to market every single moment of every single day so you have a smoother ride higher performance and you have the ability to have a longer term time horizon that's why the institutions love it but you do have to give up something and that is liquidity so naturally, if you're going to give up liquidity, you better be paid well to do that. There's no reason to give up liquidity if you can't earn a higher return, or at least you don't believe you're going to get a higher return. So what could happen over time is if interest rates got really, really high, not where they are today, and they've obviously come up a lot, but if you saw 10 or 11 or 12% on a 10-year treasury, that's a real competitor for everything in private equity. It's going to be very tough to make a lot of money in a private equity business, unless you're buying at that time. But at the same time, if we, like we do, own a bunch of private credit firms or infrastructure companies or other things that actually could benefit 
from either you know a persistent tailwind like infrastructure or higher interest rates like the private credit firms because almost everything there is floating rate it's not fixed rate you're actually minting money at that point in time today as an example our private credit managers they're getting paid five percentage points 500 basis points more for the same loan doing no additional work with really no additional risk of what they took three years ago when they underwrote it just simply because the Federal Reserve has raised rates by five points. And because their loans are based off of a floating rate, they're getting paid 500 basis points more than they were before. So we're intentional about that. We make sure in our portfolios that we have both private equity and private credit, but also we will be very involved in real estate at the right time. We'll be very, very involved in distressed financials and those that specialize in that area, as well as obviously in infrastructure and real assets, which are just persistent themes that we think are going to be important for a long period of time. The other thing, I, this, sorry, I, I, one thing I, to your question, I think is really important for the listeners to know. Most people do not realize the amount of shrink that has happened at the public markets. The public securities markets have shrunk dramatically in quantity not necessarily in magnitude because you have trillion dollar companies like Apple, et cetera. But what you have is much fewer public companies than you did five years ago and 10 years ago and 15 years ago. So private equity has become a much larger percentage owner of the real economy and the real businesses that are out there. So it can absorb the trillions of dollars of new money coming into it, which obviously benefits us as the owner of those businesses that are getting those new flows from institutional investors, like you mentioned. So one thing you mentioned with the floating rate, because this has always been kind of puzzling to me, I think in in theory, it's great, you know, oh, you, you, you make more, more return as the rates go up. The problem is, is the risk of default goes up too, because if companies can't pay that floating rate, that higher floating rate, then all of a sudden, now they're going to default on the loan. So in, in a sense, it's, it's, it's higher risk with floating rate. It, well, let me let me reframe that. In a slightly sure. rising environment, it's probably fine. When you go up five percentage points in a year, maybe not so much. So, how do you, how do you how would you answer that? It, it's an it's an excellent point that people have to be aware of that you're going to have to get something, give something in order to get something. Naturally, if you have a company whose EBITDA, and we actually know of a couple situations like this where it used to be twenty percent of their EBITDA, their cash flow earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, 20% of it was dedicated to debt service. Now, just because rates moving up, it's 70%. So they were highly levered and those higher rates have a big impact on them. So yes, default rates do tend to go up when you see that kind of a spike in rates, but here's the way the math works. Overly simplistic math here, but let's just take XYZ credit manager and they're earning an average of 8% on their money and they average in a particular year when the economy is good, one half of 1% of defaults. And just for simplicity, assume they don't have any recovery, which they, they would. They would get some of their money back through the bankruptcy process. But let's just assume they don't. If you make 8% on 100% of your portfolio and you lose a half a percent from default, well, then you're still 7.5 net positive. Well, if rates go to 13 because of a 5% increase, and your default rate goes up, even if it went up by five percentage points, which is worse than the global financial crisis, we've never actually seen that, but it doesn't mean it can happen. You would still be at a seven and a half percent net return because of the fact that your default rates have been offset by your rising rates. Now, typically what happens is that default rate doesn't go up by 500 points, 500 basis points. It's going to go from a half of 1% to maybe a percent or maybe one and a half percent, or maybe even 2%. If you have a real, real stressed environment like the global financial crisis, where depending on what type of loan you're looking at, you know, there were defaults as high as 3%. But if you're making 13, and even if you had 3% of defaults, you're still making 10, which is a lot better than the seven and a half that you were making before. But the key is, is every single credit manager is different. Some take a lot less risk, some take a lot more risk. So one of the key criteria for us is they must have, and I'll just borrow from one of our managers, a very much of a credit first, no losses mentality. One of the firms that we own a stake in, 
Monroe Capital, which is one of the ones that a lot of your investors or listeners can actually go out and invest in. They have a publicly traded BDC. So does Golub, another firm that we own a stake in. Really, really great companies. And that literally is something people can buy uh, today if it's appropriate for them and suitable for them. But Monroe Capital and Golub both, they have loss ratios of less than 0.1 of a percent over their entire history. Because even when things don't go well, they have the expertise and they have the capability to help that business survive and or take it back and then ultimately make it successful on the other side of a default. So it's really important in the private credit world to know exactly how much risk they're taking and whether or not they're properly being paid for the risk, which is why we default, uh, we defer, better term in this context, we defer to these larger firms that have long-term proven track records that have been through the global financial crisis, they've been through COVID, they've been through, in many cases, the tech bubble. They've been there, done that, they've shown that they can survive tough environments. We want to see people that have been there, done that, and it's not their first rodeo. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, all right. So I wanted to touch on a little bit um, kind of what's going on globally, because there's there's a lot going on globally, especially now as of this week. Um, so what is your how would you look at at kind of like the future, which I know we can all tell, right? We're all we're, we're all future tellers here. Uh, but generally, like the way you see kind of things lining up from a macro perspective, like how does this impact the economy going forward and private equity and other things. So we are you know, at a very high level and anybody can go to our website, casinvestments.com. We literally have put every single quarterly letter we've ever written for the last 22 years. We put them on our website, which is a little dangerous, but we make sure that everybody knows what we're thinking at all times. So you can go there and read a lot more detail than I'm going to provide right now. But Suffice it to say, we summarize our position. We are in the higher for longer, meaning rates are going to stay higher than people think for longer than people want to admit. We are very much in the stagflation camp. We think there's a good chance we're going to have a, a pretty material recession, simply because the pressure coming on the consumer, which I'll come back to in a moment. But even if we don't see a recession, we think we're going to have a stagnant economy, the higher persistent sections of inflation. And that is a very, very bad environment for traditional stocks and bonds. And then we add to it, most likely, a higher energy price for a lot of reasons that we can get into that is going to be a tax on the consumer. That means that you're going to have all of these factors that lead to a slowing economy or a slower economy, which means it's going to be very difficult to just own plain vanilla and get really, really good returns over the next five to 10 years as well as the fact that with interest rates where they are, we do not expect the Fed to come and just start cutting rates dramatically. We don't expect long rates to come down really, really quickly. So bonds are going to be an okay place to be, but not a strong place to be, which is why we are focusing for our personal capital. And I didn't say this earlier, but I mean, we're investors of our own capital first. That's what we exist for. And we've got, including our shareholders, over $600 million of our own money in our own vehicles. We truly exist to invest for ourselves, and then other people can come alongside us if they want to do that. But when we look for where we want to put our money right now, it's in things that don't correlate to GDP, things that don't correlate necessarily to the stock market. Everything has some level of correlation, but we want as little as possible. GP stakes, very little overall correlation and diversification across the cycle. Professional sports, very little correlation. They've shown that over time, disruptive technology and some of the other things that we're involved in, energy as well. But so those are the places that we want to allocate our capital. Now, consumer, this is important. I'm assuming most of your listeners, because if they're listening to this podcast, they're following the news at a pretty high level, typically. You know, student loans are now obviously having to repay it again. You also have credit card rates averaging over 22%. And credit card balances are as high as they've been since before COVID. And so there's just no way to reconcile this, that the consumer is going to have more pressure on them. And now you take conflict in the Middle East, on top of the conflict in Eastern Europe, on top of the other tension with China, et cetera, et cetera. And you start to get a sense that the consumer is just going to be a little bit less free with their capital. Now, if you go to any resort, you go on any you know, restaurant, doesn't feel that way. 
but basically there's more and more people putting it on their credit card to maintain the lifestyle of what they really were hoping, you know, what they got used to when money was free after COVID. So when you add all of that together with higher rates, which are affecting businesses, with the coming train wreck that is, you know, uh, commercial real estate, which has been talked about plenty, and it is a train wreck coming, that is going to impact the, the regional banks more than anybody. That is the fuel for the American economy. Most people don't realize that the vast majority of small to medium-sized business loans in the United States don't come from the J.P. Morgans and the Bank of Americas of the world. They come from small regional banks that are willing to invest in their local communities. Without that, you lose a lot of growth. That is going to be virtually impossible as most regional banks now are upside down in their bond portfolio. And we saw what that did to Silicon Valley and First Republic. And now they're also 50% of their loan portfolio is in commercial real estate on average, some higher. Those are all factors that lead us to believe that it's just going to be tough in plain vanilla to make good returns for the next decade. It's going to take unique and differentiated access to opportunities that are not just plain vanilla in the alternative world to get steady, solid returns over the next uh, five to 10 years. Yeah, no, I, I like I like where your head's at. I think we we think very similarly. One question that keeps coming in my mind is, you know, when I think about interest rates and the Fed's perspective, and they've been quite clear about what their direction is, and people don't believe them. The bond market hasn't believed them for the past year. It's like, you look at the end of, uh, was it 21, when everyone was like, oh, yeah, they're going to raise rates. And everyone's like, yeah, whatever, we're just partying. And then, you know, J January 2nd, all of a sudden the bottom starts falling out and everyone's like, what happened? I'm like, well, he told you like nine months ago it was going to happen. And even now they don't think that rates are going to stay high. They think they're going to go down. So it raises the question of what if the markets who the stock market, which doesn't seem to believe any of this, um, is where it is. Like, what's the incentive for the Fed to lower rates, which is where I think I'm in with you and your camp. But what if inflation, the CPI at least, I don't say inflation because that's a broad measure, but the CPI is is low. Let's say it's at 1%. What does the Fed do? Does the Fed keep it high? What if it goes zero? Because the CPI is composed mostly of real estate, like 42, 45% is real estate. So what if real estate starts to drop, which it should? So it's like with these measures, I guess my question to you is, what do you think is most important to the Fed? So I think the Fed is in a box. The Fed is in a box they have not been in since the early 80s. And most investors were not, in, you know, I was early in my investing career then. Most investors never lived through that environment. They don't know what the playbook is to use in that kind of environment. But the Fed right now has a problem because if they start to lower rates too soon and inflation kicks back up again, they lose all credibility. And if they wait too long and don't lower rates when they need to, they could put us into a real doozy of a recession. So they're stuck. But one thing that we can say for sure is that their focus has been stated and is clearly by mandate to be to make sure that you maintain pricing, you know, in a reasonable fashion. And everybody can debate what that means. But I think right now to this very specific question that you asked, the Fed is definitely paying attention to CPI. They're definitely paying attention to PCI and the core and all those other terms that they look at. But it's employment. Because going back to my comments about the consumer, the one reason right now that the consumer feels safe putting money on their credit cards when they shouldn't be, especially with rates where they are, but they have a job. And as long as they have a job, they'll just figure it out later and they'll kick the can down the road just like every government does, right? Until they can't, and then they have to restructure. That is unfortunately where we're probably headed. But if the Fed starts to see unemployment begin to, to really ratchet up, on top of the high interest rates that we have, they will start cutting at that point in time. But there is no indication right now that employment, that unemployment is going to drastically increase. That is to me the catalyst that drives it much more than the CPI going negative or any other of the pricing issues because ultimately the consumer is gonna be most affected by jobs. That is the largest portion of GDP by far, 70, 80% is the consumer. So therefore, they're going to focus on what's happening to the consumer. But we are already seeing those stresses, not just from credit cards, but you know, auto loans right now, there's more defaults than there were at the peak of the global financial crisis. And so the Fed is watching all of that. But what that tells me 
with the best guess of anybody can make, my hypothesis is that the Fed is going to keep them and pause for a while, but it's going to be a lot longer before they actually cut rates. I mean, again, there's, I did an interview in February of this year, and the person that was interviewing me just grilled me about the Fed has got to be cutting by the end of the year because just look at Fed funds. Look at what they're forecasting. They're going to cut by year end. I said, no, they're not. And there's no way they can with all the data that we see. The market is just hopeful and hope is not a good investment strategy. <laughs> so that is where I think the markets still don't really believe the Federal Reserve when they say that, yes, we are going to pause. But I, you know, it's really hard for me to see how they cut rates in you know April or June, like a lot of people think they're going to, unless we do have a bona fide major um, international event, which could be escalation of what's happening in the Middle East that causes the economy to really come to a grinding halt, unemployment to start to kick up, then the Fed might have to change its playbook to respond to that kind of macro event. And I pray that doesn't happen, but that is ultimately something that could change this. Yeah, it, it's... Uh... <laughs> It's it's really fascinating to watch this, and it it, it kind of brings me back to the '70s, uh, which seems to be replay uh, that that we're going to repeat the '70s all over again, and it's not going to be exactly the same, but it seems to be lining up very similarly in all different aspects with energy, with stagflation, and we you could argue whether stagflation's hitting, although I would argue that it probably has, but it's you know depends on what you look at. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to me, it's, it's it's fascinating to see what is going to actually come of this. And that's and that's the interesting thing is, is that, you know, 50 years ago, most people that are right now investing capital for others, they were not investing then. They were either in school or, you know, right. a, a glimmer in somebody's eye. So they had not experienced that. And that is the recommendation that I would make for every one of your listeners is go back and study the 70s and the 80s. Because if that doesn't end up happening, fine. But if it does end up replaying, you're prepared. Right. Yeah. It's just it's hard to imagine an upside much higher than this. And then we've all been conditioned the last 20 years that the market only goes up. So it's uh it'll be uh it'll be interesting times to say the least. Well, Christopher, I know we gotta run here in the interest of time. I know uh you've got a clock here, but uh I'd love to have you in the show. Where can people find more about you? So casinvestments.com is the best place to go. We have a tremendous amount of information that's available for people on that website. And here over the next couple of months, we are, have some really exciting announcements that we're going to put out. But that is the best place to go, casinvestments.com. And obviously, we'd be happy to you know, communicate with anyone that wants to contact us via that website. Great. Well, thank you very much, Christopher. We'll, we'll have you back on in the future because uh, as, as, uh, as the world evolves, everything will change as it always does. So exactly. thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it and happy to come back and do it again. Hey, Doug, did you hear? We're giving away free money. Well, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But before I do, there's a saying in the mining community, well, precious metals mining, that is. The saying is that if you want the best deals, you have to be in the room. Now, you're probably thinking, what does it mean to be in the room? Well, I'll tell you. Being in the room means that you're on the short list of people who get invited to be a part of the best deals. These are the deals that most investors will never have access to. You mean like IPOs? Nope, IPOs are chump change. Those are for retail investors, small potatoes. That's nothing compared to these deals. These deals would have you salivating to get access to them. Once you know they exist, you will never look at investing the same way again. I almost don't want to even tell you that they exist because it will ruin your thinking of how the investing world really works. Now, you might be excited that these deals exist, but you only have access to the deals if you're an insider or in the room, as they call it. Now, as loyal listeners to the show, I'm going to give you a chance to be in the room. Money Tree Investing Podcast has created the Insiders Club. This is a community of our show's members who are loyal listeners of the show and want to get more out of their investing experience. Being a part of the Insiders Club gives you insider status for upcoming events and webinars, discounts, free stuff and books, and influence on the future direction of the show. This is a great opportunity to join us as we expand our content and services. Oh, and did I mention free money? Yes, in the next few weeks, I'll be giving away free money to our members of the Insiders Club as my appreciation for listening to the show. 
Now, there's no cost to join the Insiders Club. Just go to moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money today to join the community. That's www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money. I hope to see you in the room. All right. Well, that was a great interview with Christopher. Really appreciate him coming on the show. Uh, I really learned a lot from that interview. And uh, now we're into the panel portion of the show where we have our very own Barb Freeberg. Hey, Barb. Good morning, everyone. We also have our very own Megan Gorman. Hey, Megan. Hi. How you doing, Kirk? Doing great. Doing great. And we also have our very own Phil Weiss. Hey, Phil. Hey, Kirk. How are you today? Good. Doing well. I'm feeling um, I'm feeling happy. I got a full boat here. I got we got a big panel, <laughs> lots of lots of input here. This is great. So looking forward to this. So let's start with you, Barb. What were some of your takeaways from the interview? My takeaways were this is not for everyone. This is for the uber wealthy. And for those of us that don't fall into that boat, there are other ways to invest. Cool. All right. Well, it sounds like this is the uh, what I told my son for his Halloween costume. This is not appropriate for everyone. So <laughs> anyway, Megan, I don't want to tell you what he picked out his first time. But anyway, Megan, what about you? What are some of your takeaways? Yeah, first of all, I, I echo Barb's sentiments. This is not a space for most investors, right? And you have to tread carefully. I do think it's really important to understand it because over the past 25, 30 years, in a lot of ways, the public markets have shrunk and the private markets have prospered. And so you're hearing more and more about the private markets than you ever did before. And I, I will tell you, you know, the private markets, so we can get into the nuts and bolts of it. What I have been surprised by is that as a way to in, in sort of enhance things for sort of regular investors, I am seeing more funds come across, uh, you know, my desk for just anyone to get access to in the private markets. But again, going back to what Barb said, and I'm, I'm want to hear what Phil has to say, this is not an appropriate space for everybody. Yeah, no, totally. And, and we'll get into the details here. Phil, what, what are some of your takeaways here? I'm going to echo what both Barb and Megan have said, and that this is not for everybody. This is not something that my clients are really looking for or that I would typically use for them. Because you know, just to give you an example, I had a client, different type of investment, but I got a new client. He came over and his former broker put him in with a, in a private REIT. And we, he thought, fortunately it wasn't, but he thought it was bankrupt. And that's the kind of thing that happened. It's very opaque. The reporting that comes with a lot of these things can be very opaque. You don't really know what's going on. It's not like when you're trading in the public markets and there's lots of readily available information. There can still be you know, misdeeds that can happen in the public markets, but it's a lot harder for them to happen because there's so many more things that are looking looking out and watching over them. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's that's a, a great perspective. So, um, Barb, let's let's go to you first because I know we're talking about accredited investors here, and obviously, uh, in order to get into this space, you need to be accredited. So maybe you can define that for the uh, for the audience here. The accredited investor definition has recently changed to broaden a little to include more people. But in general, the first step is you either have to have a net worth of over a million dollars, excluding your primary residence, either individually or with your partner. And you need income over 200,000 individually or 300,000 with your spouse or partner for each of the last two years. But hang on, if you don't meet that criteria, the uh, SEC has broadened it to include investment professionals who should know what they're doing and holding a general securities license of like a series seven, a series 65 or series 82, or directors and executives of uh, company selling securities. Um, so, or if you're knowledgeable and can prove it. So a uh, bottom line is you have to have a certain net worth and income level, or you have to have some real good financial investment knowledge to be what is titled an accredited investor. 
You have to have knowledge and prove it. That's going to be a tough one, Barb, because there's a lot of professionals out there that can't prove it. and They've been doing it for decades. So uh, interesting. So, Megan, let's go to you, because I want to talk about some of the pros and cons of, mm -hmm. of GP stakes, because I think, I mean, you spend a lot of time in this space. Mm -hmm. I don't, but uh, I think it's an important to get your context since you kind of live this. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's not appropriate for everyone. And yet it is an incredibly fascinating space, right? So when we're talking about the private markets, you're talking about venture capital, you're talking about private equity, private real estate, private credit, and infrastructure. Those are their main categories and all have different um, you know, underlying risks to them. But what I would tell anyone who's thinking about the private markets, and he mentioned this quite a bit in the interview because it's really, really important. You have to be a patient investor, right? So if you're somebody who is day trading and so on, private markets are not for you because what you're doing, and, and he talked about this in context of the hedge fund versus a private market investment, is you are typically committing to something that's at least 10 years with potential to add on a couple more years. Right. And the reason is it's like that is you are trying to take advantage of what we call the illiquidity premium. And what that technically means is it's an incremental return that is going to compensate you as the investor for owning an asset that's not highly liquid. So how this works is, you know, when you are going into the private markets, you don't just do one and done. You are going in with an understanding that every year you are going to make commitments, right? And these commitments are for at least 10 years and each year is considered a vintage. So it's sort of like wine and different years have better vintages than other years. Also in different years, some vintages focus on things like this year, we're seeing a lot of middle market buyout. That's the stylistic you know, aspect of this vintage. Uh, in the past, we've seen things like distress. So there's a market cycle riding through there. So if you meet the accredited investor definition that Barb brings up, you know, your goal is to decide how much you are going to commit in a given vintage across the private markets. And you want to be consistent and you want to be looking for the best opportunity set. And he talked about this a lot because there, there are fund managers out there who are unbelievable, have a very, very high record. You know, he talked about pension funds and endowments. Um, I sit on the board of an endowment, right? I'm actually going there today. Um, and we get access to top tier managers, managers who have consistent returns. And because we've invested in them year after year, we can get access to them. And access is one of these things that's really challenging in the private markets, because even if you're the richest guy in the world, you just don't automatically get access to that, right? A lot of these funds have had the same subscribers for years and they don't have any open slots or the minimums are incredibly high. So getting access to the best opportunity sets in the private markets are really high. So if you're an investor in this space, you wanna be vintaging and you wanna vintage every year. And the reason is to take advantage of the illiquidity premium, we have something called the standard J curve, right? So let's say I commit a million dollars to a private equity fund. They're not going to call me, call the million dollars all up front. Uh, the only exception to that, if it's a niche fund, but look, in general, it's not called up front. But over the first sort of four to six years, you're getting capital calls and they come at random times, right? So you may get a capital call for $70,000 or, you know, 123,000. These are really random numbers and they're calling it and they're putting your money to work. So what happens is in the standard J curve, you think of a J, your value actually goes down in the beginning because you're putting your money to work. And for investors, it's really frustrating. I think Phil brought up like it's opaque. It's really opaque. You'll get some sort of commentary that's usually like six months after the fact on what they invested in. And you're like the valuation, you're never in real time because it's, it's the reporting takes such a long time. But what's really important here with the private markets and why people do it is when they put the money to work in the first four or five years, in the last five years, you're harvesting, you're harvesting distributions, whether a company gets sold, whether a company goes IPO, all of that gets harvested. And that's what people are looking for, because what they're hoping for is they get a better internal rate of return and they get really strong distributions. 
And so this is going to sound crazy, but for wealthy investors, the private markets are a great retirement income tool. Because once you have a couple of vintage years going, they're distributing out income to you. And you can actually live off the income or you can reuse it to meet your other capital costs. So I know I said a lot in a very short period of time, but that's sort of the mechanics of investing in the private markets and why it's, you know, it's a, it's a patience game. And it's, a, it, it's why they want people to be an accredited investor, as Barb pointed out. Yeah, that's great insight, Megan. Thank you for that. Um, Phil, what about you? What, what do you see as kind of pros and cons of this asset class? Like I said before, this is not an asset class that I would normally use. Um, I do think I, I was happy that Barb reminded me of the fact that they changed the rules for accredited investors because it used to just be based upon your income or your net worth. And I never thought that made sense because having a certain amount of money or earning a certain amount of money doesn't apply any knowledge. And like you said, just because we have that knowledge doesn't mean that everybody applies it in the right way, but at least having some knowledge is helpful in trying to understand what it is that you're investing in. And, and what Megan talked about with the, the time frame that's really important to remember. You put your money into something like this, you're adding money, you're adding money, you're adding money. And you wait a while till anything comes back. So you've got to be in a position where you can do that, where you can not only wait to get your return, but also know that you're going to have to put more capital in as time goes on. And that if you need the money for some reason, it's going to be really hard, if not impossible, to get it out. So Phil and Barb, I have a question for you, Kirk, too, because you know the private markets were always like for an exclusive group of investors, right? But you know, I am seeing more and more companies come up with mutual funds that give you access to the private markets, um, you know, or, or sort of private investments that are more 1099, right? You don't get a K-1. Um, the illiquidity premium shorter. It's like you only have to be in for a year. How should people be looking at those, right? Like if you had a client come to you, what do you say, right? Because I think that's where a lot of our listeners are seeing that stuff come across? That's a really good question because recently in the Jobs Act in 2010, it that act made these types of formerly unavailable investments readily available. And so you've seen a whole upcropping of crowdfunding or um, different platforms that can give you access a lot to different real estate deals and commercial real estate deals. And they, if they have a lockup, they're much, much, much shorter. It's easier to get in and out. And they frequently promise these ultra high returns. And they even have different types of asset classes. Aside, from, they have startups, they have art all sorts of asset classes. So my personal opinion is this is riskier and you're going to pay a little bit higher in fees, which would be expected, but it's more of an unknown. So in terms of all types of speculative investings or what I consider outside your traditional stock, bond, um, cash equivalent type investments. If you want to take a flyer or if you want to try and boost your returns a little, fine. Just do so with only a small portion of your total investable assets. I usually say 5%. So uh, Phil, what about you? So one thing that's changed and there's another area where or type of firm that are investing is I remember I worked for T. Rowe Price and at one point in time, they couldn't invest in I, the pre-IPOs, you know, the, the the private companies or anything, and now even the mutual funds can invest in these too. But you think about the idea, you really do want, if you're going to do this, decide how much of your portfolio it's going to be. It's just like if you go into a casino in Las Vegas, right? And you say, I'm going to bring in, this is the amount of money that I'm willing to lose. And that's really how much you should be willing to invest in these because it could go totally wrong and you could end up with nothing. So you don't want to, put yourself in a position where you have a loss that you can't handle, that you can't compensate for, that you can't adjust to. So think about for that this could be a total loss. doesn't mean it's going to be, but it could be. So think ahead about how much are you willing to, to risk when you're making these type of investments. Yeah, I think those are good perspectives. I mean, you know, if you think about 
I think the one thing that I come back to all the time is that this space is like many others where it it goes through cycles, right? There are cycles where it's out of favor. There are cycles where it's in favor. Uh, I started doing this when I was uh, when I started in 99. And back then, hedge funds were getting cool. Like, oh, I want to have a hedge fund. Like, hedge funds is a cool thing. Let's find a way to get a hedge fund. No one knew what it was. No one knew how to do it. It was just like, hey, it's cool. I can I could talk in my golf club. I got a hedge fund. You don't. You know, it's like as, as if somehow that's going to make you money. Um, but I get it, right? When people have uh, a certain amount of wealth, they like to one up each other on what they have access. It's about access, right? This is very common. It's like, oh, I have access and you don't. And it's less about the returns, but the the interesting thing is they got uh, really sexy. Everyone wanted one, and then the performance started to stink. Now it wasn't because the performance stunk; it's because every Tom, Dick, and Harry got in the space and like, hey, I can run a hedge fund too and make two and twenty. And it was it was like, oh, it's a way to get easy money. And then this the the performance started to stink right because there's just too many people who weren't great and the great ones still were great but just there are many people who weren't um and i've seen this through asset class over asset class you know the the managed futures everyone got in that and then that performance cooled off for like years and and you know i i in in part i did some research a bunch of years back where i attributed a lot of the correlation of alternative investments to the fact that they were institutionalized so before they were institutionalized, they were non-correlated. As soon as they become institutionalized, they become correlated, right? All the assets are chasing the same money. So it naturally correlates to the market activities. So what's interesting is, you know, private equity is the newest uh, uh, phase of this. And uh, GP stakes is kind of the, the hot thing, although I'm not hearing about it yet, but I'm definitely getting a lot of calls from people who want to sell me theirs, which is probably not a good sign. Um, but, uh, but it, it's interesting to note, I think that, um, there, it's still a good space if you do it right. And Megan certainly has a lot of, uh, history and knowledge in this space. I think more than the rest of us in the panel, but I think it's just good to note that this asset class, like any other has its ebbs and flows. It's got its ups and downs. It's got periods where it's probably not advisable. And then there are periods where it is, uh, to Phil's point about the, um, the non-traded REIT, I remember back in 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, we were getting tons of calls in 2009 from people who wanted to get out of their non-trade REITs. And these weren't clients. These are just people who were who had them from somewhere else and wanted to get out. And we they found us because we do alternatives. And so they're getting calls like, I need to get out of my non-trade REIT. I'm like, I don't know. Let me do some research and found out there's some private uh, private marketplaces where people were buying them for like 10 cents in the dollar. I'm like, I I, I kind of want to go in there and buy them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like Probably not a good time to sell, but great time to buy. So I think just keep in mind, especially as, as we go into potentially a recession in 2024, just keep in mind that, you know, these cycles are good and bad times to buy and just know where you are in the cycle. So you can, you can purchase it correctly. Um, so I did want to talk about carry a little bit, Megan. I did want to ask you because um, this is something that's been in the news oh, for over a decade. You know, the politicians come after like the carry as a tax benefit and like, oh, these people are getting this bonus tax treatment. Can you talk a little bit about what it is and, and how it works for the for the home gamers? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, to go into private markets, you're going to pay a higher cost to get access, right? And, and just to give an understanding of why the fees are slightly higher is there is a lot of diligence that goes into, you know, if, a, if you're going into a fund, what managers they invest in and the underlying investments, right? So there are, private markets are probably one of the most strictly due diligence investments out there. And there's an expense to that, right? At, what happens is typically, there is something called carried interest, right? And that is like a percentage of the investment for profits that a fund manager gets his compensation, right? And what is quote unquote controversial about it is that instead of being taxed at ordinary income tax rates, it gets taxed at long-term capital gains rates, right? So if you think about that, that can be in some states like California, and 18% tax savings. So it's pretty significant. 
Um, so this is something that year after year they have brought up for tax reform, and it consistently does not get reformed. Um, but that's sort of the big, uh, you know, controversy around it. So I think the thing is, anyone who's going into this market, you have to remember you're going to pay a lot more in fees. But the goal is also on a net after tax, after fee basis, you know, you still, you know, have a significant return. Awesome. Well, thanks, Megan. That's that's really helpful. Um, and yeah, and I guess we're going to probably wrap it up here soon uh, in the interest of time. But uh, final thoughts from you, Phil. I guess that the key the key thing here is if you're interested in this, make sure that you're comfortable. Make sure that you are that you are educated, that you understand what what you're investing in, understand what the lockup periods are, understand what the potential pad is, and be willing know that you that you're putting yourself at risk. Those are the the key things to me to keep in mind. Uh, as for me, you know, I work with women facing new beginnings. And I know that experience a big life transition can be stressful. So my job is to help empower women facing new beginnings with the financial knowledge and tools they need to make self-assured decisions. My firm's Apprise Wealth Management. You can download my free ebook at apprisewealth.com slash ebook. And you can also sign up for my blog. And thanks for having me today, Kirk. Great. Thanks for coming on, Phil. Uh, Barb, final thoughts from you. Know what you're investing in. And if you're investing with an advisor, hold him or her accountable. Ask about the fees, ask about their compensation for this type of investment. And for those of you that aren't interested in this, there's nothing wrong with a diversified, simple, passive investment portfolio that follows the market in either stock or bond investments. You'll pay low fees. And if you hang in over the long term, you're likely to get pretty decent returns as well. I'm Barbara Friedberg. You can find me on YouTube or at Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance. Thanks for coming on, Barb. And uh, Megan, final thoughts from you. Yeah, I mean, it's an exciting asset, asset classes. However, it's not for everyone. And when I work with clients, I tell them out of the gate, all the negatives. You're going to be illiquid. It's going to be a higher fee structure. You're not going to file your taxes on time. And it's going to be a really, you know, hard to understand experience as to what is going on until the latter years of these types of investments. And so I've had clients who meet the definition, who have dove in and they love being in the space. And I have other clients who are like, it's not for me. So know who you are as an investor, just because you have a certain asset base doesn't mean you have to invest in a certain asset class. So I'm Megan Gorman. You can find me on Instagram at All the President's Money. Kirk, thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on, Megan. That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us on Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at innovativewealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.